This is a mechanism of disease map for vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis. These are two conditions that involve inflammation of the vestibular nerve and the inner ear, respectively, and they both cause severe vertigo, which is their most prominent symptom. We'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of these conditions. And as in all of these flowcharts, all of the boxes are color-coded according to this legend in the top right. I'll be removing all of these boxes and talking through them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with vestibular neuritis, which is simply an inflammation of the vestibular nerve. It's a very simple pathophysiology as far as we know. And unfortunately, we don't have a very good understanding of the etiology of vestibular neuritis. It's been attributed to a few different things, but it's largely considered idiopathic. Here are the leading theories. Microvascular ischemia, or lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen, is thought to play a role in vestibular neuritis. Autoimmune diseases are thought to play a role as well. The most prominent um, theory is probably viral infection. This could be vir a systemic viral infection, such as an acute upper airway infection. It's pretty common that a person has a viral illness, like a, just like a cold or a cough, that leads to a vestibular neuritis for a few months. It's also uh, some evidence that latent herpes simplex virus can be reactivated and trigger an episode of vestibular neuritis. Next, some risk factors. It's most prominent in people that are aged 30 to 50, and there's no gender predisposition for vestibular neuritis. It's equally likely in women as in men. The manifestations of vestibular neuritis, we said vertigo is the most prominent manifestation. You can have associated nausea and vomiting, and of course with vertigo you'll have increased risk of falls. You might also notice nystagmus in the patient uh, that's on physical exam. So the symptoms for vestibular neuritis tend to develop over the time period of hours. The most severe symptoms, the really bad vertigo, the vomiting, tends to last for a day or two, but milder symptoms, like just mild disorientation or just kind of patient feeling wobbly or just feeling like the room is spinning when they're laying down, that can persist for months. So it could be like an ongoing problem. And it tends to last longer than BPPV, which uh, is usually on the order of seconds to one minute in duration. So that's one way you could differentiate them. Next, let's discuss labyrinthitis. This is inflammation of the inner ear, which includes most prominently the membranous labyrinth. And we'll see that labyrinthitis has the exact same symptoms, plus a few more, plus some hearing loss. So first, etiology of labyrinthitis. This one is better established. We have directly linked some viral infections to labyrinthitis, and this happens to be the most common cause of labyrinthitis. You can have some viruses congenitally, like rubella virus or cytomegalovirus, if there's a maternal virus that the baby gets when it's born through the birth canal. You can also have acquired viral labyrinthitis. This is through the mumps virus, the measles virus, herpes simplex, influenza, HIV, and varicella, and varicella zoster virus can all cause this. There's also bacterial labyrinthitis. This typically follows a bacterial infection like acute otitis media, meningitis, mastoiditis, syphilis, or cholesteatoma. And some medications can do it. Some ototoxic medications like aminoglycosides can cause labyrinthitis. And the pathophysiology here is that these microbes or these toxins essentially make their way into the inner ear through the round or oval window. Remember, these are the two passageways from the, from the middle ear to the inner ear, and they cause labyrinthitis that way. They cause inflammation in the inner ear that way. There are some other things that directly cause labyrinthitis. Autoimmune diseases like vasculitides have been shown to cause it. Head trauma can cause labyrinthitis as well. And vascular ischemia here can cause labyrinthitis as well. So lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen. Again, the same risk factor here, age 30 to 50 years old is the most common um, age group for labyrinthitis. And this one actually does have a gender predisposition. So women are more likely to get labyrinthitis than men. As I mentioned, the symptoms are very similar to vestibular neuritis. Patients still have the vertigo, associated nausea, vomiting, the increased risk of falls, and the nystagmus. In addition, they also have hearing loss and tinnitus. So it's kind of like vestibular neuritis plus. It's affecting the uh, entire labyrinth, um, not just the nerve that leaves the vestibular system. So it's kind of more broad in its manifestations, more broad in its presentation. Next, there's a specific type of labyrinthitis that's caused by varicella zoster virus, and this is actually called herpes zoster oticus, also known as Ramsey-Hunt 
syndrome. This is essentially a type of shingles that happens in the inner, in, in the in the ear um, in general. You'll actually notice manifestation in the external ear. So there are some additional symptoms here. You can see an ear rash, for instance, um, as well as a fever, a more systemic viral reactivation, as well as facial paralysis. So in herpes zoster oticus, you can have labyrinthitis plus a few more symptoms. So plus fever, plus that ear rash, which is essentially shingles in the external ear canal, as well as facial paralysis. I hope this short flowchart was helpful for th these two diseases, and thank you for listening.